Hare Krishna. Okay, we'll start with our Mangala Charanam and then carry on with our Andi Ramrita. Om Gyana Timirandasya Gyananjana Sanakaya Chakshurum Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobhishtam Stavitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Tadati Swapadam Kikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Tapadakamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavamustra Shri Rupam Sagajatam Sagana Ragunatam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvetam Savatutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padam Sagana Lalita Shri Visakan Vitam Stra He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Pando Jagapati Gopisa Gopika Kanta, Radha Kanta Namastate, Tapta Kanchana Gorangi, Radhe Vrindavaneshwari, Vrishabhanu Sute Devi, Ranamani Hari Priye, Vansaka Pata Rubescha, Kripa Sindhu Bhaevacha, Patitanam Pavane Bhyo, Vaishnave Bhyo Namo Namaha, Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gedadhara Shri Vasadi Gora Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shrimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Kuravani Vajarine Nirse Sasunyavari Paschatari Jatarine Hare Krishna <clears throat> So we're on chapter 19 and uh, I had to check in the book to see where we are, but I think it starts with the name. It's Steve talking, I remember. That's not the one. A bit further on. The new one. <clears throat> where is this? Here we go. So we're just at the top there, with Steve is speaking about India. Yeah. So I don't know if anybody would like to read first or uh, whatever anyone prefers to do. Steve, I wanted to show my appreciation for spiritual India. So I presented to Swamiji that I had read the autobiography of Gandhi. It was glorious, I said. What is glorious about it? Swamiji challenged. When he asked this, there were others present in the room. Although I was a guest, he had no qualms about challenging me for having said something foolish. I searched through my remembrance of Gandhi's autobiography to answer his challenging question, what is glorious? I began to relate at one time Gandhi as a child, although raised as a vegetarian, was introduced by some of his friends to eat meat, and that night he felt that a lamb was howling in his belly. Swamiji dismissed this at once, saying, most of India is vegetarian, that is not glorious. I couldn't think of anything else glorious to say, and Swamiji said, his autobiography is called Experiments with Truth, but that is not the nature of truth. It is not to be found by someone's experimenting. Truth is always truth. Although it was a blow to my ego, being exposed and defeated by Swamiji seemed to be a game for me. I wanted to bring before him many different things for his judgment, just to see what he had to say about them. I showed him the paperback edition of the Bhagavad Gita that I was reading and carrying in my back pocket. He, pers he perused the back cover. There was a reference to the eternal faith of the Hindus and Swamiji began to take the phrase apart. 
He explained how the word Hindu was a misnomer and does not occur anyway in the sun anywhere in the Sanskrit literature itself. He also explained that Hinduism and Hindu beliefs were not eternal. Bruce, after I talked about my desire for a religious life, I began telling him about a conflict he had with one of my professors in English literature. He was a Freudian, so he would explain the characters in all the novels and so on in a Freudian context and with Freudian terminology. Everything was sexual, the mother for the son, this one for that one, and so on. But I would always see it in terms of a religious essence. I would see it in terms of a religious impulse or some desire to understand God. I would write my papers in that context, and he would always say, the religious can always be interpreted as Freudian. So I didn't do very well in the course. I was mentioned in this to the Swami. And he said, your professor is correct. I was surprised. I'm going to an Indian Swami and he is saying that the professor was correct, that everything is based on sex and not religion. This kind of pulled the rug out from under me when he said that. Then he qualified what he'd said. He explained that in the material world, everyone is operating on the basis of sex. Everything that everyone is doing is being driven by the sex impulse. So, he said, Freud is correct. Everything is, everything is on the basis of sex. Then he clarified what material life is and what spiritual life is. Spiritual life, that is a complete absence of sex desire. So this had a profound effect on me. He wasn't confirming my old sentimental ideas, but he was giving me new ideas. He was giving me his instructions and I had to accept them. Talking to the Swami was very nice. I found him completely natural and I found him to be very artistic. The way he held his head, the way he enunciated his words, very dignified, very gentlemanly. The boys found Swamiji not only philosophical, but personal also. Steve, a few nights later, I went to see the Swami and he told me I was reading his book. One thing that had especially caught my attention was a section where the author of Srimad Bhagavatam, Yasudev, was admitting that he was feeling despondent. Then his spiritual master, Narada, explained that his despondency had come because he had written so many books. He had neglected to write in such a way as to fully glorify Krishna. After hearing this, Yasudev compiled the Srimad Bhagavatam. When I read this, I identified with the fact that yesterday was a writer because I considered myself a writer also, and I knew that I was also despondent. This was very interesting about the author of yesterday, I said. He wrote so many books, but still he was not satisfied because he had not directly praised Krishna. Although I had very little understanding of Krishna consciousness, Swamiji opened his eyes very wide, surprised that I was speaking on such an elevated subject from the Srimad Bhagavatam. He seemed pleased. Chuck, I had come by in the afternoon and Swamiji had given me a plate of prasadam, so I was eating and a chili burned my mouth. Swamiji said, is it too hot? Yes, I said, so he brought me a tiny teacup with some milk. Then he took some rice off my plate and took a piece of banana and crushed it all up together with his fingers and said, here, eat this, it will kill the action of the chilies. Bruce, there wasn't anything superficial about him, nor was he really contrived, trying to make some impression. He was just complete himself. In the Swami's room, there was no furniture, so we ate on the floor. And I found this to be very attractive and simple. Everything was so authentic about him. Uptown, at another Swami's place, we had sat in a big stuffed living room chairs and the place had been lavishly furnished. But here was a downtown Swami wearing simple cloth robes. He had no business suit on. He wasn't covering up a business suit with those saffron robes and he wasn't affected as the other Swami was. So I found myself asking him if I could be a student and he said yes. I was very happy because he was so different from the other Swami. With the uptown Swami, I was wanting to become his student because I wanted to get something from him. 
I wanted to get knowledge. It was self, selfishly motivated, but here I was actually emotionally involved. I was feeling that I wanted to become the Swami student. I actually wanted to give myself because I thought he was a good, he was great. And what he was giving was pure and pristine and wonderful. It was a soothing balm for the horrible city life. Uptown, I had felt like a stranger. Does anybody want to take over? On one occasion, our conversation had turned to my previous trip to India in 1962, and I began talking about how much it meant to me, how much it moved me. I even mentioned that I had made a girlfriend there. So we got to talking about that. And I told him that I had her picture. I was carrying the girl's picture in my wallet. So Swamiji asked to see. I took out the picture and Swamiji looked at it and made a surface and said, she is not pretty. Girls in India are more beautiful than that. Hearing that from the Swamiji just called my attachment. I had for that girl, I felt ashamed that I had an interest in a girl that the Swami did not consider pretty. I don't think I ever looked at that photograph again and certainly I never gave her another thought. Bruce was a newcomer. I'd only been to one week of meetings at the storefront. So no one had told him that the members of the Anad Ashram, Dr. Mrs. Yoga Retreat, had invited Swamiji and his followers for a day in the upstate countryside. Bruce had just arrived at the storefront one morning when he heard someone announce that Swami is leaving and Prabhupada came out of the building and stepped into the car. In a fit of anxiety, Bruce thought that Swami was leaving them for good for India. No, however, told him, we're going to the yoga ashram in the country. But the other car had already left and there was no room for Swamiji's car. Just then, Steve showed up. He had expected the boys to come up, come by his apartment to pick him up. Then boys had missed the ride. Bruce pointed, Bruce phoned a friend up in the Bronx and convinced him to drive them up to an Andashram. But when they got to Bruce's friend's apartment, the friend had decided he didn't want to go. Finally, he lent Bruce's car and Swamiji's two followers set out for Ananda Ashram. By the time they arrived, Prabhupada and his group were already taking prasadam, sitting around a picnic table beneath the trees. Ananda Ashram was a beautiful place with sloping hills and lots of trees and sky and green grass and a lake. The two latecomers came walking up to Swamiji and seated like a father of a family at the head of the picnic table. Keith was serving from a big walk and onto the individual place. When Prabhupada saw his two stragglers, he asked him to sit next to him. Keith said, Prabhupada took Steve's chapati and he helped it up with the amount of sugar and Steve munched on uh, bread and sugar while everyone laughed. Prabhupada began talking somehow about lion tamers and he recalled that once at a fair he had seen a man wrestling with a tiger rolling over and over with it down a hill. The boys who rarely heard Swamiji speak anything but philosophy were surprised. They were delighted city kids taking to the country by their guru and having a good time. Steve, I was walking with Swamiji across a long gentle slope. I wanted him to see and approve a picture of Radha and Krishna I had found in a small book, Narada Bhakti Shastra. I had planted I had planned to get a color reproduction of it and to give each of his followers. So as we were walking across the grass, I showed them the picture and asked them whether it was a nice picture of Radha and Krishna for reproducing. He looked at the picture, smiled, nodded, and said yes. Bruce, I walked with Swamiji around the grounds. All the others were doing something else, and Swamiji and myself were walking alone. He was talking about building a temple there. Prabhupada walked across the scenic acreage, looking at the distant mountains and forests, and Keith walked beside him. Prabhupada spoke of how Dr. Mishra had offered him the island in the middle of the ashram's lake to build a temple on. What kind of temple were you thinking of? Keith asked. How big? 
Rabat smiled and gestured across the horizon, as big as the whole horizon. He laughed. Yes, Prabhupada replied. A few and under. A few and under ashram men and women came by. And one woman was wearing a sari. Prabhupada turned to the other woman and said, a woman who wears a sari looks very feminine. It was late afternoon when some of Swamiji's followers gathered by the lake and began talking candidly about Swamiji and speculating about his relation to God and their relation to him. Well, said Wally, Swami never claimed to be God or an, or an incarnation, but he says that he is a servant of God, teaching love of God. But he says that the spiritual master is non different from God, said Harold. They stood at the edge of the Mirari Calm Lake and concluded that it was not necessary to talk about this. The answers would be revealed later. None of them really had much spiritual knowledge, but they wanted their faith to deepen. Afterwards, Keith, Wally, and Howard wandered into the meditation room. There was a seat with a picture of Dr. Mishra, who was away in Europe. But the most remarkable thing was a blinking strobe light. I felt like I'm in a head shop on St. Mark's place, said Wally. What kind of spiritual meditation is this? Howard asked. A Mishra follower wearing a white kurta and white bell bottom replied that their guru has said they could sit and meditate on this light. Swamiji says you should meditate on Krishna, says he. Said. After sunset, everyone gathered in the large room of the main building to watch a slideshow. It was a loose collection, mostly of assorted slides of India and the Ananda Ashram. Record by a popular Indo Indian sitarist, sitarist was playing in the background. Some of the slides were of Vishnu temples. And when one slide passed by quickly, Prabhupada asked, let me see that. Can you go back? Let me see that temple again. This happened several times when he recognized familiar temples in India. Later in the show, there was several slides of a girl, one of the members of Dr. Mishra's ashram demonstrating Indian dance poses. As one of her pictures passed, an ashram man joked, turn back and let me see that temple again. The joke seemed at Swamiji's expense and in poor taste. His followers didn't laugh. Then came Swamiji's lecture. He sat up cross-legged on the couch in the largest room in the mansion. The room was filled with people. The Swami's followers from the Lower East Side as well as the Ananda Ashram Yogi or standing along the walls and in the doorway, he began his talk by criticizing demo democracy. He said that because people are attached to sense gratification, they vote for a leader who will fulfill their own lust and greed. And that is their only criterion for picking a leader. He went on for 45 minutes to explain about the importance of Krishna consciousness. His reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder moving silently. Then he led a kirtan that bridged all differences and brought out the best in everyone that night. Several nights before in his apartment on 2nd Avenue, Parapad had taught his followers how to dance. They had formed a line behind him while he demonstrated the simple step. Holding his arms above his head, he would first swing his left foot forward across the right foot and then bring it back again in a sweeping motion. Then he would swing his right foot over the left and bring it back again. With his arms upraised, Parapar would walk forward, swinging his body from side to side, left foot to right side, right foot to left side, in time with the one, two, three rhythm. He had shown them the step in regular time and in a slow half-time rhythm. Keith had called it the Swami step, as if it were a new ballroom dance. Parapar's followers began dancing Soon the others joined them, moving around the room in a rhythmic circle of ecstasy, dancing, swaying, sometimes leaping and whirling. It was a joyous, hour-long kirtan, the Swami encouraging everyone to the fullest extent. A visitor to the ashram happened to have his string bass with him, and he began expertly turning out his own swinging bass improvisations beneath the Swami's melody, while another man played the tablas. The Ananda Ashram members had been divided of late into two tense, standoffish groups. There was the elderly crowd, similar to the old ladies who had attended the Swami's uptown lectures, 
and there was the young crowd, mostly hip couples. But in the kirtan, their rifts were forgotten, and as they discovered later, even healed. Whether they liked it or not, almost all of those present were induced to rise and dance. Then it was late. The Swami took rest in the guest room and his boys slept outside in their sleeping bags. Howard, I awaken three or four times and each time I'm flat on my back looking up at the stars, which are always in different positions. My sense of time is confused. The side wheel shifts, dizzy me. Then, just before morning, I dream. I dream of devotees clustered around a beautiful golden youth. To see him is to be captivated. His transcendental body radiates an absolute beauty unseen in the world. Stunned, I inquire, who is he? Don't you know, someone says, that's the Swami. I look carefully but see no resemblance. The youth appears around 18, straight out of Vaikuntha, spiritual world. If that's Swamiji, I wonder to myself, why doesn't he come to earth like that? A voice somewhere inside me answers, people would follow me for my beauty, not for my teachings. And I awake, startled. The dream is clear in my mind, more like a vision than a dream. I feel strangely refreshed, bathed in some unknown balm. Again, I see that the constellations have shifted and that the dimmer stars have faded into the encroaching dawn. I remember Swamiji telling me that although most dreams are simply functions of the mind, dreams of the spiritual master are of spiritual significance. Keith also had a dream that night. Keith, I saw Krishna and Arjuna on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. Arjuna was inquiring from Krishna and Krishna was reciting the Bhagavad Gita to him. Then that picture phased out and the images changed. And there was Swamiji and I was kneeling in front of him, and the same dialogue was going on. I had the understanding that now is the time that Swamiji is presenting the same thing as Krishna, and we are all in the position of Arjuna. The dream made it very clear that hearing from Swamiji was as good as hearing from Krishna. The sun rose over the mountains, streaking the morning sky above the lake with colours. Wally and Keith were walking around the grounds, saying to Parapad how beautiful it all was. We are not so concerned with beautiful scenery, said Parapad. We are concerned with the beautiful one who has made the beautiful scenery. Later, Parapad sat next to Bruce in the Volkswagen returning to the city. The car went winding around on a ribbon of smooth black mountain road with lush green forests close in and intermittent vistas of mountains and expansive sky. It was a rare occasion for Bruce to be driving Parapad in a car. Because none of the Swami's boys had cars, they would always travel by bus or subway. It seemed fitting for the Swami to have a car to ride in. But this was only a little Volkswagen, and Bruce winced whenever they hit a bump and it jostled Parapad. As they wound their way on through the mountains, Bruce recalled something he had read in a book by Aldous Huxley's wife about the best places for meditation. One option had been that the best place to meditate was by a large body of water because of the negative ions in the air. And the other opinion was that it was better to meditate in the mountains because you are higher up and closer to God. Is it better for spiritual realization to meditate in the mountains, Bruce asked. Farapad replied, this is nonsense. There is no question of better place. Are you thinking that God is up on some planet or something and you have to go up high? No, you can meditate anywhere. Just chant Hare Krishna. After some time, the drive became tiring for Parapad and he dozed, his head resting forward. Bruce walked with Swamiji up to his apartment, opening the door for him, adjusting the window as he liked it and preparing things in his room, as if he were the Swami's personal servant. Parapad settled back into his second avenue apartment feeling pleased with the visit to Ananda Ashram. The Kirtan had been successful, and one of Dr. Mishra's foremost students had commented that he was impressed by Parapad's followers. Simply by chanting, they seemed to be achieving an advanced level of yoga discipline. 
whereas we have more difficulty with all our postures and breath control. The United States recently increased involvement in Vietnam was, uh, was creating an increase of opposition to the war. On July 29th, American planes had bombed North Vietnam's two major population centers, Hanoi and Haiphong. An escalation which brought e expressions of regret from several allied countries, including Canada, France and Japan. United Nations Secretary General Yu Thant openly criticized America's policy in Vietnam. Further oppositions to the war ranged from the US Senate down to newly formed pacifist groups and dissenters held peace marches, sit-ins and rallies in protest of the war and draft. Religious protest was held by Pope Paul VI and the World Council of Churches decried America's involvement in Vietnam and called for a halt in the fighting as the most effective step towards negotiation. On August 6, the anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima, um, there, was, there were demonstrations in many major American cities, including a peace vigil at the United Nations headquarters in New York. On August 31st, there would be another two week peace vigil before the United Nations General Assembly building. And Mr. Larry Bogart had invited Prabhupada and his followers to open the vigil of praying for peace. Larry Bogart, who worked at the United Nations headquarters, had become friends with the Swami and had volunteered his help by arranging to print stationery for the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. The letterhead was designed by James Green with a sketch of Radha and Krishna, and Mr. Bogart's name also appeared on the stationery at the head of the list of ISKCON trustees. Prabhupada accepted Mr. Bogart's invitation to the peace vigil. Prabhupada saw it as an opportunity to publicly chant Hare Krishna, so he was glad to attend. He announced to his congregation that Monday the 31st, instead of the usual morning class at 6.30, everyone should meet at the United Nations headquarters for a special kirtan. August 31st. Some met at the storefront and went by bus, carrying cartels, a tambourine and the Swami's bongo. Swamiji rode with a few of his followers in a taxi. The typical dress of his followers consisted of well-worn sneakers, black pants or blue jeans, and t-shirts or button-down sports shirts. Traveling uptown in the early morning put the boys in a light-hearted spirit, and when they saw Swamiji at the UN in his flowing saffron robes, they became inspired. Swamiji began, chant began the chanting, but right away the peace vigil organizers stepped in and asked him to stop. This was a silent vigil, they said, and it should have prayer for non-violent silence. The boys were crushed, but Swamiji accepted the restriction and began silently chanting on his beads. A dignitary stood up before the assembly and made a short speech in which he mentioned Gandhi, and then he turned to Prabhupada and indicated that he could now speak about peace. Standing erectly, the UN skyscraper looming behind him, Swamiji spoke in a soft voice. The world must accept that God is the proprietor of everything and the friend of everyone, he said. Only then we will, only then can we have real peace. Mr. Bogart had scheduled the Swami for two hours of silent prayer. Prabhupada had the devotees sit together and softly chant Japa until their two scheduled hours were up. Then they left. As Prabhupada rode back downtown in the heavy morning traffic, he said New York reminded him of Calcutta. Amid the start and stop motion and noise of the traffic, he explained, we have nothing to do with the peace vigils. We simply want to spread this chanting of Hare Krishna, that's all. If people take to this chanting, peace will automatically come. Then they won't have to artificially try for peace. Somebody else like to read? Third. Um, 
United Nations building. Steve brought the clippings into Prabhupada. Swami, look, they have referred to you here as Sami Krishna. <laughs> Prabhupada, Sami Krishna, that's all right. In the picture, some of the boys were sitting with their heads resting on their arms. Where are you? Prabhupada asked. Steve pointed. Oh, you chant like this with your head down? Prabhupada had participated in a peace vigil to oblige his contract, Mr. Bo um, uh, Mr. Bogart. Now Mr. Bogart was fo was phoning to offer his appreciation and greeting to visit the, sto uh, the storefront and agreeing to visit the storefront. He wanted to help and he would discuss how the Swami could work with the UN and how he could solicit help from important people for his movement of Indian culture and peace. Prabhupada regarded Mr. Bogart's imminent visit as very important and he wanted to cook for him personally and receive him in his apartment with the best hospitality. When the day arrived, Prabhupada and Keith cooked together in the small kitchen for several hours, making the best Indian delicacies. Prabhupada posted Stanley downstairs and, and told him not to t allow everyone, anyone to come up while he was cooking the feast for Mr. Bogart. Stanley assented, blinking his eyes and, uh, with his far off saintly look. Stanley stationed himself downstairs in the storefront. A few of the boys were there and he told them, you can't go up to see the Swami, no one can. About 12 noon, Larry Bogart arrived pale, elderly, and well-dressed by the Lower East Side, sta East Side Standards. He said he wanted to see Swami Bhaktivedanta. Sorry, Stanley informed him, his boyish face trying to impress the stranger with the seriousness of the order. The Swami is busy now, and he said no one can see him. <laughs> Mr. Bogart decided he would wait. There was no chair in the storefront, but Stanley brought him a folding chair. It was a hot day. Mr. Bogart looked at his watch several times. A half hour passed. Stanley sat, <laughs> Stanley sat chanting and sometimes staring off blankly. After an hour, Mr. Bogart asked if he, if he could see the Swami now. Stanley assured him that he could, he, he could not. And Mr. Bogart left in a huff. <laughs> Upstairs, Swamiji had become anxious wondering why Mr. Bogart had not arrived. Finally, he sent Keith downstairs and Stanley told him about the man who had turned, he had turned away. What, Keith exploded? But that was within moments, Swamiji heard what had happened. He became furious. He came down, <laughs> he came down to the storefront. You fool, you silly fool. He turned and angrily rebuked everyone in the room but mostly stanley no one had ever seen the swami so angry then the, then swami walked you walked away in disgust and returned to his apartment <laughs> stanley had been going off the deep end for some time <laughs> and now he became even more abstracted in his behavior stanley's mother knew her son had been troubled for years and she had therefore requested Prabhupada to keep a very close watch on him but now the boy deteriorated in his responsibilities and stopped cleaning the kitchen and storefront. He would stand alone looking at something. He was gloomy and sometimes spoke of suicide. And he stopped chanting regularly. The boys didn't know what to do, but they thought perhaps he should be sent home to his mother. One day Stanley went up to see the Swami. He came in and sat down. Prabhupada, yes? Stanley, may I have $50? Prabhupada. Why? Prabhupada used to handle all the money himself, so when his boys needed something, even if it were only 25 cents for the bus, they had to see Swami. He was never wasteful. He was so frugal that whenever he received a letter, he would carefully tear the envelope apart and use the reverse side as writing paper. So he wanted to know why Stanley wanted $50. Stanley replied in a small voice, Oh, I want to purchase some gasoline and set myself on fire. Prabhupada saw Chuck at the doorway and told him to call Bruce at once. Bruce quickly came up and sat with Prabhupada and Stanley. 
Pampa told Bruce, whom he had recently appointed to handle petty cash, to give Stanley $50, and he, and he had Stanley repeat why he wanted the money. But Swamiji, Bruce protested, we don't have that much money. There you see, Stanley, Prabhupada spoke very calmly. Bruce says we don't have the money. Then they phoned Stanley's mother. Later, Prabhupada said that because Stanley had asked for $50 for gasoline, which cost only 35 cents, he could therefore understand Stanley was crazy. Keith was cooking lunch in the kitchen as usual, but today Swamiji was standing by the kitchen stove watching his pupil. Keith paused and looked up from his cooking. Swamiji, could I become your disciple? Yes, Prabhupada replied. Why not? Your name will be Krishna Das. This simple exchange was the first request for discipleship and Prabhupada's first granting of initiation. But there was more to it than that. Prabhupada announced that he would soon hold an initiation. What's initiation, Swamiji? One of the boys asked. And Prabhupada relied, uh, replied, I will tell you later. First, they had to have beads. Keith went to Tandy's leather company and bought half-inch wooden beads and cord to string them on. It was much better, Swamiji said, to count on beads while chanting. A strand of 108 beads to be exact. This employed the sense of touch. And like the Vaishnavas of India, one could count how many times one chanted the mantra. Some devotees in India had a string of more than a thousand beads, he had said, and they would chant through them again and again. He taught the boys how to tie a double knot between each of the 108 beads. The number 108 had a special significance. There were 108 Upanishads, as well as 108 principal gopis, the chief devotees of Lord Krishna. The initiates would be taking vows, he said, and one vow would be to chant a prescribed number of rounds on the beads each day. About a dozen of Swamiji's boys were eligible, but there was no strict system for their selection. If they wanted to, they could do it. <clears throat> Although I was already doing whatever Swamiji recommended, <clears throat> I sensed that initiation was a heavy commitment. And with my last strong impulses to remain completely independent, <clears throat> I hesitated to take initiation. Prabhupada's friends saw the initiation in different ways. Some saw it as very serious, and some took it to be like a party or a happening. <clears throat> While stringing their bees in the courtyard, Wally and Howard talked a few days before the ceremony. Wally, it's just a formality. You accept Swami Aji as your spiritual master. Howard, what does that entail? <clears throat> Wally, nobody's very sure. In India, it's a standard practice. Don't you think you want to take him as a spiritual master? Howard, I don't know. He would seem to be a good spiritual master, whatever that is. I mean, I like him and his teachings a lot. So I guess in a way he's already my spiritual master. <clears throat> I just don't understand how it would change the situation. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> Wally, neither do I. I guess it doesn't. It's just a formality. September 8th. Janmastami Day, the appearance day of Lord Krishna. One year before, Prabhupada had observed Krishna's birthday at sea, aboard the Jaladuta, just out of Colombo. Now exactly one year later, he had a small crew of Hare Krishna chanters. He would gather them all together, have them observe a day of chanting, reading scripture, fasting and feasting. And the next day would be initiation. At six o'clock, Prabhupada came down and was about to give his morning class as usual, when one of the boys asked if he would read from his own manuscript. Prabhupada appeared shy, yet he did not hide his pleasure at having been asked to read his own Bhagavad Gita commentary. Usually he would read a verse from Dr. Radhakrishnan's Oxford edition of the Gita. Although the commentary presented in person as philosophy, the translations, Prabhupada said, were 90% accurate. But this morning he sent Roy up to fetch his manuscript, and for an hour he read from its typewritten pages. For observing Janmastami, there were special rules. There should be no eating, and the day was to be spent chanting, reading, and discussing Krishna consciousness. 
If anyone became too weak, he said, there was fruit in the kitchen, but better that they fast until the feast at midnight, just like the devotees in India. <clears throat> he said that in India, millions of people, Hindus, Muslims, or whatever, observed the birthday of Lord Krishna. And in every temple, there were festivities and celebrations of the pastimes of Krishna. <coughs> Sorry. And now he said at length, I will tell you what is meant by initiation. Initiation means that the spiritual master accepts the student and agrees to take charge. And the student accepts the spiritual master and agrees to worship him as God. He paused. No one spoke. Any questions? <laughs> and when there were none, he got up and walked out. The devotees were stunned. What had they just heard him say? For weeks he had stressed that when anyone claims to be God, he should be considered a dog. My mind's just been blown, said Wally. Everybody's mind is blown, said Howard. Swamiji just dropped a bomb. They thought of Keith. He was wise. Consult Keith. But Keith was in hospital. Talking among themselves, they became more and more confused. Swamiji's remark had confounded their judgment. Finally, Wally decided to go to the hospital to see Keith. Keith listened to the whole story, how Swamiji had told them to fast and how he read from his manuscript and how he said that he would explain initiation and how everybody had leaned forward all ears and Swami, Swamiji had dropped a bomb. The student accepts the spiritual master and agrees to worship him as God. Any questions? Swamiji had asked softly, and then he had walked out. I don't know if I want to be initiated now, Wally confessed. We have to worship him as God. Well, you're already doing that by accepting whatever he tells you, Keith replied. And he advised that they talk it over with Swamiji before the initiation. So Wally went back to the temple and consulted Howard, and together they went up to Swamiji's apartment. Does what you told us this morning, Howard asked, mean that we're supposed to accept the spiritual master to be God? That means he's due the same respect as God, beings God represent, being God's representative, Prabhupada replied calmly. Then he's not God? No, Prabhupada said, God is God. The spiritual master is his representative. Therefore, he's as good as God because he can deliver God to the sincere disciple. Is that clear? It was. <clears throat> I'll want to, I'll just get rid of the, the pictures in the right. It was a it was a mental and physical strain to go all day without eating. Jan was restless. She complained that she couldn't possibly stay any longer, but had to go take care of her cat. Prabhupada tried to overrule her, but she left anyway. Most of the prospective initiates spent several hours that day stringing their shiny red wooden beads. Having tied one end of the string to a window bar or a radiator, they would slide one bead at a time up the string and knot it tightly, chanting one mantra of Hare Krishna for each bead. It was devotional service, chanting and stringing your beads for initiation. Every time they knotted another bead, it seemed like a momentous event. Prabhupada said that devotees in India chanted at least 64 rounds on beads a day, saying the Hare Krishna mantra once on each of the 108 beads constituted one round. His spiritual master has said that anyone who didn't chant 64 rounds a day was fallen. At first, some of the boys thought that they would have also have to chant 64 rounds, and they became perplexed. That would take all day. How could you go to a job if you had to chant 64 rounds? How could anyone chant 64 rounds? Then someone said Swamiji had told him that 32 rounds a day would be a sufficient minimum for the West. Wally said he had heard Swamiji say 25, 
but even that seemed impossible. Then Prabhupada offered the rock bottom minimum, 16 rounds a day without fail. Whoever got initiated would have to promise. The bead stringing, chanting, reading and dozing went on until 11 at night, where everyone was invited up to Swamiji's room. As they filed through the courtyard, they sensed an unusual calm in the atmosphere, and Houston Street, just over the wall, was quiet. There was no moon. As his followers sat on the floor, contentedly eating prashadam from paper plates, Swamiji sat among them, telling stories about the birth of Lord Krishna. Krishna had appeared on this evening 5,000 years ago. He was born the son of Vasudeva and Devaki in the prison of King Kamsa at midnight and his father Vasudev immediately took him to Vrindavan, where he was raised as the son of Nanda Maharaj, a cowherd man. Prabhupada also spoke of the necessity of purification for spiritual advancement. It is not enough merely to chant holy words, he said. One must be pure inside and out. Chanting impurity brings spiritual advancement. The living entity becomes impure because he wants to enjoy material pleasure. But the impure can become pure by following Krishna, by doing all works for Krishna. Beginners in Krishna consciousness have a tendency to relax their efforts in a short time. But to advance spiritually, you must resist this temptation and continually increase your efforts and devotion. Michael Grant. I first heard about the initiation just one day before it was to take place. I'd been busy with my music and hadn't been attending. I was walking down 2nd Avenue with one of the prospective initiates and he mentioned to me that there was going to be something called an initiation ceremony. I asked what it was about and he said, all I know is it means that you accept the spiritual master of God. This was a big surprise to me and I hardly knew how to take it. But I didn't take it completely seriously and the way it was mentioned to me in such an offhand way made it seem not very important. He asked me very casually whether I was going to be involved and I also being very casual about it, said, well, I think I will, why not? I'll give it a try. Jan didn't think she would make an obedient disciple and initiation sounded frightening. She liked the Swami, especially cooking with him, but it was Mike who convinced her. He was going, so she should come along with him. Carl Jurgens knew something about initiation from his readings and he, more than the others, knew what a serious commitment it was. He was surprised to hear that Swamiji was offering initiation and he was cautious about entering into it. He knew that initiation meant no illicit sex, intoxication or meat eating and an initiated disciple would have new responsibilities for spreading the teachings to others. Cole was already feeling less involved since the Swami had moved to Second Avenue but he decided to attend the initiation anyway. Bill Epstein had never professed to be a serious disciple. Holding initiation was just another part of the Swami's scene, and you were free to take it seriously or not. He figured it was all right to take initiation, even if you weren't serious. You would try it. Carol Becker was surprised to hear that some people would be taking initiation, even though they had no intentions of giving up their bad habits. She had stopped coming around regularly ever since the Swami had moved and she felt no desire to ask for initiation. The Swami probably wouldn't initiate women anyway, she figured. Robert Nelson hadn't forgotten the Swami and always liked to help wherever he could. But except for an occasional friendly visit, he had stopped coming. He mostly stayed to himself. He still lived uptown and wasn't into the Lower East Side scene. James Green thought he wasn't pure enough to be initiated. Who am I to be initiated? but the Swami had asked him to bring something over to the storefront. I came and it was just understood that I was supposed to be initiated, so I thought, why not? Stanley had been chanting regularly again and had come out of his crazy mood. He was sticking with the Swami and his followers. He asked his mother if he could be initiated and she said it would be all right. Steve wanted more time to think about it. Keith was in the hospital. Bruce had only been attending for a week or two, and it was too soon. Chuck was on a week's vacation from the regulated spiritual life at the temple, so he didn't know about the initiation. No one, no one was asked to shave his head or even cut his hair or change his dress. 
No one offered Prabhupada the traditional Guru Dakshina, the donation a disciple is supposed to offer as a gesture of his great obligation to his master. Hardly anyone even relieved him of his chores, so Swamiji himself had to do most of the cooking and all the preparations for the initiation. He was perfectly aware of the mentality of his boys, and he didn't try to force anything on anyone. Some of the initiates didn't, he didn't know until after the initiation, when they had inquired that the four rules, no meat eating, no illicit sex, no intoxication, and no gambling, were mandatory for all disciples. Rothbard's reply then was, I'm very glad that you are finally asking me that. Yeah, yeah. Stop there. Okay. It was to be a live Vedic sacrifice with a ceremonial fire right there in the front room of Swamiji's apartment. In the center of the room, in the center of the room was the sacrificial area. Arena, a platform of bricks, four inches high and two feet square, covered with a mound of dirt. The dirt was from the courtyard and the bricks were from a nearby gutted building. Around the mound were 11 bananas, clarified butter, sesame seeds, whole barley grains, five colours of powdered dyes and a supply of kindling. The 11 initiates took up most of the remaining space in the front room as they sat on the floor knee to knee around the sacrificial arena. The guests in the hallway peered curiously through the open door. For everyone except the Swami, this was all new and strange, and every step of the ceremony took place under his direction. When some of the boys had made a mess of trying to apply the Vaishnava of Tilak to their foreheads, Prabhupada patiently guided his finger with their foreheads, making a neat narrow V. He sat before the mound of earth, looking out at his congregation. They appeared not much different from any other group of young hippies from the Lower East Side who might have assembled at any number of happenings, spiritual, cultural, musical or whatever. Some were just checking out a new scene. Some were deeply devoted to the Swami, but everyone was curious. He had requested them to chant the Hare Krishna mantra softly throughout the ceremony and the chanting had now become a continual drone accompanying his mysterious movements as head priest of the Vedic rite. He began by lighting a dozen sticks of incense. Then he performed purification with water, taking a spoon in his left hand. He put three drops of water from a goblet into the, his right and sipped the water. He repeated the procedure three times. The fourth time he did not sip, but flipped the water onto the floor behind him. He then passed a spoon and goblet around for the initiates who tried to copy what they had seen. When some of them placed the water in the wrong hand or sipped it the wrong way, Swamji patiently corrected them. Now he said, repeat after me. And he had them repeat one word at a time, a Vedic mantra of purification. Om Apavitra Pavitrova Sarvavashtam Gato Piva Yasmaret Pondar Kasham Sa Bahab Bahab Yantara Suchi Sri Vishnu Sri Vishnu Sri Vishnu. The initiates tried faltering to follow the pronunciation of the words which they had never even heard before. Then he gave the translation Unpurified or purified, or even even having passed through all situations, one who remembers the lotus eyed supreme personality of Godhead is cleansed within and without. Three times he repeated the sipping of water. The drone of the Hare Krishna mantra filled the room as the goblet passed from initiate to initiate and back again to him. And three times he led the chanting of the mantra, Om Apavitra. Then he raised the hand. And as the buzzing of the chanting trailed off into silence, he began his lecture. After the lecture, he asked the devotees one by one to hand him their beads, and he began chanting on them. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. The 
the sound of everyone chanting filled the room. After finishing one strand, he would summon the owner of the beads and hold the beads up while demonstrating how to chant. Then he would announce the initiate's spiritual name and the disciple would take back the beads, bow to the floor and recite, Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Sri Mati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine I offer my respectful obeisances unto his divine grace I see Bhakti Vedanta Swami who is very dear to Lord Krishna having taken shelter at his lotus feet. There were 11 initiates and in, initiates and so 11 sets of beads and the chanting lasted for over an hour. Prabhupada gave each boy a strand of neck beads which he said were like dog collars identifying the devotee as Krishna's dog. After Wally received his beads and his new name, Umapati, he returned to his place beside Howard and said, that was wonderful, getting your beads is wonderful. In turn, each initiate received his beads and his spiritual name. Howard became Hayagriva, Wally became Umapati, Bill became Ravindra Swaroop, Carl became Kalapati, James became Jagannath, Mike became Kunda, John became Janaki, Roy became Raya and Stanley became Strayadisha. Another Stanley, a Brooklyn boy with a job and, and Janos, a college student from Montreal, both of whom rather had rather peripheral relationships with the Swami appeared that night and took initiation, initiation with the rest, receiving the names Satchavarata and Janardana. Anybody want to take over? When the Swami Ji began the fire sacrifice by Wrinkling the colored eyes across the mound of earth before him, with fixed attention, his congregation watched each mysterious move as he picked up the twigs and wooden splinters, dipped, dipped them into the clarified butter, lit them in a candle for him, and built a small fire in the center of the mound. He mixed the sesame seeds, barley, and clarified butter in a bowl, and then passed the mixture around. Each new disciple took a handful of the mixture to offer into the fire. He then began to recite Sanskrit prayers, asking everyone to please repeat them. Each prayer ending with the responsive chanting of the word Swaha three times. And with Swaha, the initiates would toss some of the sesame barley mixture into the fire. Swamiji kept pouring butter, piling up wood and chanting more prayers until the mound was blazing. The prayers kept coming and the butter kept pouring and the fire got larger and the room got hotter. After 15 or 20 minutes, he asked each of the initiates to place a banana in the fire. With 11 bananas heaped on the fire, the flames began to die and the smoke thickened. A few of the initiates got up and ran coughing in the other, into the other room, and the guests retreated into the hallway, but Swamiji went on pouring the remaining butter and seeds into the fire. This kind of smoke does not disturb, he said. Other smoke disturbed, but this kind of smoke does not. Even though everyone's eyes were watering with irritation, he asked that the windows remain closed. The most of the smoke was contained within the apartment and no neighbors complained. Swamiji smelled broadly, rose from his seat before the sacrificial fire, the blazing tongue of Vishnu, and began clapping his hands and chanting Hare Krishna. Placing one foot before the other and swinging from side to side, he began to dance before the fire. His disciple joined him in dancing and chanting, the smoke abated. He had each disciple touch his beads to the feet of Lord Chaitanya and planted out the picture on the table and finally allowed the windows open. As the ceremony was finishing and the air in the apartment was clearing, Swamiji began to laugh. There was so much smoke, I thought they might have to call the fire brigade. Prabhupada was happy, he arranged the prasadam he distributed to all the devotees and guests, the fire, the prayers, the vows, everyone chanting Hare Krishna, all created an auspicious atmosphere. Things were going forward. Now they were initiated devotees in the Western world. Finally, most of the disciples went home to their apartments 
leaving their spiritual masters to clean up after the initiation ceremony. September the 10th, the morning after initiation, Prabhupada sat in his apartment reading from a commentary on the Sriman Bhagavatam. The large Sanskrit volume lay before him on his desk as he read. He wore horn-rimmed glasses, which changed his demeanor, making him look extremely scholarly. He wore eyeglasses only for reading, and this added to the visual impression that he had now gone into a deep profession, professional meditation. The room was quiet, and brilliantly mid-morning sunlight shone warmly through the window. Someone sud suddenly someone knocked on the door. Yes, come in. He looked up, removing his glasses as Mike and Jan, now Mukunda and Janaki, opened the door, peering in. He had asked to see them. Yes, yes, come in, he smiled. And they walked in and closed the door behind them. Two voracious young Americans. From his expressive eyes, he seemed to be amused. They sat down before him. And Prabhupada playfully addressed them by their new initiated names. So are you living together? But now you have taken serious vows of initiation. So what will you do about it? Well, Mukunda seemed puzzled. Isn't there any love in Krishna consciousness? Damaji nodded, yes, so I'm saying, why don't you get married? They agreed it was a good idea, and Prabhupada immediately scheduled a wedding date for two days later. Swamiji said he would cook a big feast and hold the marriage ceremony in his apartment. And he asked Mukunda and Janaki to invite their relatives. Both Mukunda and Janaki had grown up in Oregon, and their family members found it impossible to travel such a long distance on such short notice. Only Janaki's sister, Joan, agreed to come. Joan, little did I know what kind of wedding it would be. All I knew was that they had met a Swami and were taking Sanskrit from him as well as attending his small storefront temple on Second Avenue. When I met the Swami, he was sitting beside the window in his front room, bathed in sunlight, surrounded by pots of prasadam. When he was disputing to the devotees who were sitting around him against the world, I was a follower of microbiotic and not so eager for taking this noonday meal. When I entered the room, the Swami said, who is this? And Mukunda said, this is Janaki's sister, Joan. She has come from Oregon to attend the wedding. Swamiji said, oh, where is Oregon? Mukunda said, it's 3,000 miles away on the other side of the United States. And he asked, oh, coming from so far, very nice. And when will the other members of the family arrive? And I said, I'm the only one who is coming for the wedding, Swamiji. He said, never mind, it is very nice that you have come. Please sit down and take some Krishna prasadam. He offered me some dal, a rather moist sabji, yogurt, salad, and japatis. But because I was a devotee of microbiotics, all of this prasadam was very unpalatable to me. Practically speaking, it was sticking in my throat the whole time. But I remember looking over at the radiant and beautiful person who was so eager for me to take this prasadam that he had prepared. So I took it all, but in my mind, I decided this was, would be the last time I would take this luncheon with the devotees. At any rate, somehow I finished the meal and Swamiji, who had been looking over at me, said, you want more, you want more? And I said, no, thank you, I'm so full. It was very nice, but I can't take any more. So finally the prasadam was finished and they were all getting up to clean and Swamiji commented that he wanted to see Mukunda, Janaki and myself for making preparations for the wedding the next day. So when we were all there sitting in the room with him, the Swami reached over into the corner where there was a big pot with crystallized sugar syrup sticking to the outside. I thought, oh, this is supposed to be the peace, the resistance, but I can't <laughs> possibly take any more. But he reached his hand into the pot anyway and pulled up a huge round dripping voluptuum. I said, oh no, I'm so full, I couldn't take any. And he said, oh, take, take. And he made me hold out my hand and take it. But by the time I finished the voluptuum, I was fully convinced that this would be the last time I would ever come there. Then he began explaining how in the Vedic tradition, the woman's side of the family made lavish arrangements for the wedding. Since I was the only member of the family who had come to assist, I should come to the next day and help him make the wedding feast. The next morning at night, while Janaki was decorating the room for the fire sacrifice, stringing leaves and flower garlands across the top of the room, I went upstairs to meet Swamiji. When I arrived, he immediately set me out shopping with a list, five or six items to purchase. One of those items was not available anywhere in the markets, although I spoke to so many shopkeepers. When I came back, he asked me, you have obtained all the items on the list? I said, well, everything is set for one. He said, what is that? I said, well, no one knows what Kumar is. 
He had me wash my hands and sat me down in, the front, in his front room on the floor with a five pound bag of flour, a pound of butter and a pitcher of water. And he looked down at me and said, can you make me a medium soft dough? I replied, do you mean a pastry or pie crust or short crust dough or patty greasy dough? What kind of pastry do you want? How old are you, he said. And I said, I'm 25, Swamiji. You are 25, he said, and you can't make a medium soft dough. It is a custom in India that any young girl from the age of five years is very experienced in making this dough. But never mind, I will show you. So he very deftly emptied the bag of flour and with his fingertips cut in the butter until the mixture had a consistency of coarse meal. Then he made a well in the center of the flour, poured in just the right amount of water and very deftly and expertly kneaded it into a velvety smooth, medium soft dough. He then brought it in, he then brought in a tray of cooked potatoes mashed them with his fingertips and began to sprinkle in spices. Show me how to make and form potato kachoris, which are fried Indian pastries with spiced potato filling. From 11 until five that afternoon, I sat in this one room making potato kachoris. Meanwhile, in the course of the same afternoon, Swamiji brought in 15 other special vegetarian dishes, each one in a large enough quantity for 40 persons and he had made them single-handedly in his small, narrow kitchen. Somebody want to take over? It was rather hot that afternoon, and I was perspiring. I asked Swami Jima, please have a glass of water. He peeked his head around the door and said, go wash your hands. I immediately did so. When I returned, Swami Ji had a glass of water for me. He explained to me that while preparing this food for offering to the Supreme Lord, one should not think of eating or drinking anything. So after drinking the glass of water, I went in and washed my hands and sat down. About two in the afternoon, I said, Swamiji, may I have a cigarette? And he peeked his head around the corner and said, go wash your hands. So I did. And when I came back, he explained to me the four rules of Krishna consciousness. Continued to make the kachoris, and around 3.30, 4 o'clock, it was extremely warm in the room. And as Swamiji was bringing in one of his preparations, I was wiping my arm and hand across my forehead. He looked down at me and said, please go and wash your hands. Again, I did so, and upon returning, he had a moistened paper towel for me. He explained that cooking for Krishna required certain standards of cleanliness and purity that were different than the ones I was accustomed to. About 30 people attended. The decorations were similar to the ones for the initiation a few days before, except that they were more festive and the feast was more lavish. Swamiji's front room was decorated with pine boughs and leaves and flowers were strung overhead from one side of the room to the other. Some of the new initiates came, their large red beads around their neck. They had taken vows now, 16 rounds a day, and they chanted on their beads just as Swamiji had shown them, and they happily, though self-consciously, called one another by their new spiritual names. Janaki. Swamiji said that I should wear a sari at my wedding, and he said it should be made of silk. I asked him what colour, and he said red. So Mukunda bought me an absolutely elegant sari and some very nice jewellery. The Swami's friends were used to seeing Janaki, as she always came with Mukunda, but usually she wore no makeup and dressed in very plain clothes. They were astounded and somewhat embarrassed to see her enter wearing jewellery, makeup and a bright red sari. The bride's hair was up and braided, decorated with an oval silver filigree hair ornament. She wore heavy silver earrings which Mukunda had purchased from an expensive Indian import shop on Fifth Avenue with silver bracelets. Bharapad directed Mukunda and Janaki to sit opposite him on the other side of the sacrificial fire arena. And just as at the initiation, he lit the incense and instructed them in the purification by water, recited the purification mantra, and then began to speak. He explained about the relationship between man and wife and Krishna consciousness, and how they should serve each other, and how they should serve Krishna. Bharapad then asked Janaki's sister to present her formally to Mukunda as his wife. 
Bakunda then repeated after Swamiji, I, I accept Janaki as my wife, and I shall take charge of her throughout both of our lives. We shall live together peacefully in Krishna consciousness, and there will never be any separation. And then Prabhupada turned to Janaki. Will you accept Sriman Mukunda Das Brahmachari as your life's companion? Will you serve him always and help him to execute his Krishna conscious activities? And then Janaki replied, yes, I accept Mukunda as my husband throughout my life. There shall never be any separation between us, either in happiness or distress. I shall serve him always and we shall live together peacefully in Krishna consciousness. No one knew anything of what was going on except Swamiji. He led the chanting, he gave the lines for the bride and groom to exchange, he told them where to sit and what to do. He, in fact, told them to get married. He had also cooked the elaborate feast that was waiting in the kitchen for the completion of the ceremony. Parapad asked Mukunda and Janaki to exchange their flower garlands and after that to exchange sitting places. He then asked Mukunda to rub some vermilion down the part of Janaki's hair and then to cover her head with her sari. Next came the fire sacrifice, and finally the feast. The special feature of the wedding was the big feast. It turned out to be quite a social success. The guests ate enthusiastically, asked for more, and raved about the sensational tastes. Parapad's followers, who were accustomed to the simple daily fare of rice, dal, sabji, and chapati, found the feast intoxicating and ate as much as they could get. Many of Mukunda's friends were macrobiotic followers, and at first they fastidiously avoided all the sweets. But gradually the enthusiasm of the others wore down their resistance, and they became captivated by the Swami's expert cooking. God, he's a good cook, said Janaki. Bruce, who had missed the first initiation, was seeing the Vedic fire sacrifice and tasting the Swami's kachoris for the first time. He resolved on the spot to dedicate himself to Krishna consciousness and become one of the Swamiji's disciples as soon as possible. Almost all the visitors personally approached Swamiji to thank him and congratulate him. He was happy and said it was all Krishna's blessings, Krishna's grace. After the ceremony, Mukunda and his wife entertained many of the devotees and guests in their apartment. The evening had put everyone in high spirits and Hayagriva was reciting poetry. Then someone turned on the television to catch the scheduled interview with Allen Ginsberg, the poet, and much to everyone's happiness, Allen began playing harmonium and chanting Hare Krishna. He even said there was a Swami on the Lower East Side who was teaching this mantra yoga. Krishna consciousness was new and unheard of, yet now the devotees were seeing a famous celebrity perform kirtan on television. The whole evening seemed auspicious. Back at his apartment, Prabhupada, along with a few helpers, cleaned up after the ceremony. He was satisfied. He was introducing some of the major elements of his Krishna consciousness mission. He had initiated disciples, he had married them, and he had feasted the public with Krishna Prasadam. If I had the means, he told his followers, I could hold a major festival like this every day. Yeah. Yeah. That's the end of that chapter. So we went on a little bit longer than expected, actually. Yeah, wow, we did. Yeah. yeah. There were a few points where I was saying to Hemra we should stop here, and everyone just kept reading. So, what do I know? <laughs> but it was nice. So, yeah, thanks, everyone. I was one, I just thought, one, I know I said I, I was going to try and not say anyone's name, but you know, Bruce. Yeah. He took the prasadam and about to get initiated. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that's Brahmananda. Okay. Big guy. Like I think yeah, he took the prasadam and I think that's Brahmananda. Anyway, I don't know if anybody else had any reflections or anything like that. Yeah, I met uh, Mukunda came here, I remember. Um it was about ninety one. Um uh, I remember Mukunda came and visited here. Uh, we were sitting, uh, quite, you know, about four or five of us taking prasadam with him. Always remember that. Um, yeah, so it's amazing all that went on in New York, and then he came. Um, one of them that I'm reading, we're reading about tonight, came to Scotland. You know, like, 
and I met him, you know. Mm. <laughs> totally amazing that, isn't it? It's like, you know, that was going on in New York in the 60s. And, uh, you know, I met one of those uh, people. Um, yeah, I mean, I remember, I was, I was at primary school at that time, I remember. And um, I always remember when I was like six years old, sitting in the class and, you know, I'd be looking out the window and be like, I just kind of knew there was something out there, you know. I remember, I, I remember back looking out the window, I was just like, you know, I just kind of knew there was something out there, you know, because Prabhupada says Krishna consciousness is spread by the kirtan, the, the, the love that goes out from the kirtan in the temple, you know. Do people pick up on that? People pick up on the love that's going out from our exchanges and our um, kirtans and our chanting and things, you know. So I, I remember at that time when I was six, I just knew there was something out there, you know. I remember even that far back, like looking out the window, you know. So it's amazing how uh, later in life uh, I ended up meeting Makunda here in Scotland, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. Thank you. Hi, Krishna. This is a kind of a little bit odd in a way, I think, but when mm, we read how when they were initiated and no one brought any Guru Dakshin, they didn't know to do that <clears throat> and when I went to Shira Prabhupada for my Gayatri initiation this was in 1975 it was so fast I didn't know and I didn't take any Guru Dakshin and I've always felt so sorry about that I wish I'd taken him so much but I think it was I was it was quite a surprise to me that I was told to go up to Prabhupada and I had nothing empty handed, but it kind of relieves me slightly just to hear that all of them didn't have anything either. We only had our lives <laughs> to offer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Krishna. Thanks everybody. Has anybody had anything last questions or comments or anything? Maybe that's that's us for the evening. I feel like that was a good a good Yeah, it was nice. Yeah, it was perfect. Thank you everybody. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Ki. Jai. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Bye. Right, see everybody soon. Hari Bo. Hari Bo.